morning, man. Today I want to talk about our testimonies. We all have them. If Jesus has saved, has saved your life, you have a testimony. So if you would turn to turn with me to Mark chapter 5. So Mark chapter 5, I'll be reading out of the NLT version. That's 1 through 20. It says, so they arrived at the other side of the lake, the region of the rest. When Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out of the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the burial caves and could no longer be restrained, even with, cha with a chain. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrist and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Day and night, he wandered among the burial caves and in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. When Jesus was still, still some distance away, the man saw him, ran to meet him, and bowed low before him. With a shriek, he screamed, Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already said to the, to the Spirit, Come out of the man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus demanded, What is your name? And he replied, My name is Legion, because there are many of us inside this man. Then the evil spirit begged him again and again not to send them to some distant place. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into those pigs, the spirit begged. Let us enter them. So Jesus gave permission. The evil spirits came out of the man, entered the pigs, and the, pig, and the entire herd of about 2,000 pigs plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water. The herdsmen fled to the fled to the nearby town and the surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. People rushed out to see what had happened. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus, and they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. He was sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane, and they were all afraid. Then those who had seen what happened told the others about the demon-possessed man and the pigs. And the crowd begged, pleading with Jesus to go away and leave them alone. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon possessed begged Jesus to begged him begged to go with him, but Jesus said, "No, go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful He has been." So the man started off to visit the ten towns of the region and began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he told them. <laughs> so a couple of things here. This man was healed by Jesus Christ. He had, a, he had an encounter with Jesus. Jesus delivered him. Now he's a brand new creation. And he wants to go on a mission trip with Jesus. But Jesus is like, no, no, no. You go home and share your testimony with others. And so what kind of testimony can you share? Number one, hey guys, I used to be demon-possessed, but Jesus set me free. I used to live in a cemetery. Now I live at home. I had supernatural strength. I was able to break chains because these demons possessed me and gave me this natural strength. Now I have the strength of Jesus Christ. Now we're breaking the chains of bondage and sin. I used to howl like a canine. Now he's praying in the spirit. Now he's singing to the Lord. Rivers of living water are flowing from his heart. The guy, I used to be suicidal. Now he's got hope in Jesus Christ. I used to be insane. And now he's got a brand new mind. Mind in Christ. He's got a lot to share. What a great testimony, you know? 2 Corinthians 1 9. You know, 2 Corinthians 1 9 says that God comforts us, that we may comfort others. Look at the comfort he can give other people. He can go and actually talk to people who are suicidal and give them hope. People that are insane. People with, perhaps they got, they're got demon possessed. He can go talk to these people and comfort them just the same way Christ has comforted comfort him. And so we all have testimonies. God has done something in all, our, all of our lives. You know, so start thinking about what has the Lord done for me? What has he done for you? 
And those are the things we want to we want to share. We want to share about His glory, about His His power, His 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 powerful hand, and what He does, what He has done for you. But tell people what He has done for you, and to glorify His name. Psalms chapter seventy-eight, one through eight. You virgin. <clears throat> one through eight. Oh my people, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I am saying. For I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past. Stories we have heard and known. Stories of our ancestors handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord. And about his power and his mighty wonders. For he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to, to their children. So the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born. And they in turn will teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. Then they will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. So a couple of things here. Verse 2. Verse 2 says that he's, I will teach you hidden lessons from our past. Verse 4. He's not going to hide these truths from their children. You know, too many of us want to hide our past from our children. We're going to grow up and think that we were saints. We're going to grow up and think that we were saints all our lives. Now, we did nothing wrong. They have no clue whether they, we went through what, they, what they're going through. We've got, we, we, we've got a past. And here in verse 4, he's saying, we're not going to hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation. But what are they going to talk about? God's glory and his deeds. They're not glorifying their past. They're glorifying God's deeds and God's mighty power and wonders of what he has done. You see, this guy, this demon-possessed man, is not going to glorify the fact that he was demon-possessed. That he had supernatural strength. He's not going to, you know, I used to howl like canines. That's not what he's glorifying. He's glorifying Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one who set him free. And that's the glory there. Verse 7, <coughs> Psalms says, Each generation should set their its hope in you on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles. See, I, how can they keep remembering their glorious miracles? By us reminding them. And then, Verse 8, they will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, unfaithful, <coughs> and refusing to give their hearts to God. Something about what the Lord has done for you. We went out to February. We celebrate 30 years of marriage. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Amen. And, you know, everybody that knows us sees the smiles and, and sees us holding hands and sees me opening the door for my wife and and praise God, praise God for that, right? But it wasn't always like that. In 2005, my wife actually filed for divorce. Was her, and she knew. It was an adult her, and she knew, and she knew it. But, um, you know, at work, I was just flirtatious. To lunch, or just to work. I mean, to to lunch. No friends. No friends. And he's at home. All my family's at home. Uh, I had a foul mouth. Um, horrible time. She had every right to, to, to want to leave. Child custody. I told everybody that she was done with me. She told her family. We were actually going to court. We were child custody. Failed out paperwork. And we were also, I was summoned to court on a certain day. But by then, I, I didn't want to lose my family. So... I had met one of my, my friends who started praying for our marriage and told me to, you know, to give my life to Christ and care until, until I met Max. And this, we started, I started hanging out with my friend Max. And he started reading the Bible to me. He would take me out twice a week and we'd go and read the Bible and take me out for coffee. And he kind of just started showing me scriptures and promises of the Lord. And, but one of the most important things he said is, look, if you lose your family, are you going to lose your hope in Jesus? Amen. 
and then the judge said, and they called my name, and then the judge just started drilling me for not filling out paperwork. I'm like, no, I turned everything in. She starts looking, she finds nothing. And she again starts drilling me for nothing. Wait, what do you want? You want to lose your, your children? I'm like, I filled everything, Your Honor. I turned everything in on this day and did this and did that. She couldn't find the paperwork. So she dismissed the case and started over again. Carol started crying. Prior to that, her sister had prayed. I pray that something happens in court today to reveal to you that God does not want this marriage to end. But in 2005, we filed for divorce. Here we are. He changed our hearts. He changed us. It's not because of anything I did or anything Carol did. The Lord did this. He changed our hearts. He changed my heart. He changed our heart of stone. He gave us a heart of flesh. He has given us a, a, a new love for one another. And throughout this time, we, we've been growing. Don't get me wrong. We, you know, Yes, there's times where we do bit fight or something happens. But you know, today, we are forgiven. I, I, would, I, would, I would have never humbled myself in the past and, say, and, and, and said I was sorry. But the Lord, has, the Lord changes hearts. And that's one of the greatest miracles we can see. People want to see physical miracles. Well, there's a miracle there. The miracle is that Jesus changes hearts. He can save marriage. And, and so if I can try to comfort someone in the marriage, if someone tries to go through this, I can try to comfort them since God has comforted me. And so I drew this little, little diagram here. This is actually me. <laughs> Somebody says, is that Jesus up there? <laughs> this is actually me here. These are my children. And so, prior to me, there is no Jesus Christ in my parents, my, my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather. All of these had something in common. My mom, all of it, to this day, still reminds me of how my father was an adulterer. Guess what I did? Prior to that, she reminds me that my grandfather was an adulterer. And so, I actually became that, not because I wanted to be that, it just, I, it was, I had an evil heart. But now, something has happened. Jesus Christ is in the picture. And now there's hope for all these children here, and my future grandchildren, that when they go through some type of marital problem, or they go through something, they can always look back and say, my dad's marriage was saved. My mom's marriage was saved because of Jesus. Maybe we should try Jesus. My, grand my grandchildren, you know, the God of my grandfather saved their marriage. Maybe God can save my marriage. And so forth and so forth. And that's what Psalm 78 is all about. You know, going back to, to, verse, to verse 7. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. See, so that's my job as, as, as the father, as a, as a grandfather and the great-grandfather to remind them to obey God's commands and not to forget his glorious miracle. His glorious miracle was saving my marriage, was saving my life. Verse 8, then they will not be like their ancestors. See, I don't want them to be like great-grandfather and great-great-grandfather and not knowing the Lord and doing what they want, having this machismo thing and, and you know, disrespecting their wives and cheating on their wives and... And, and everyone know it, knowing it, and they, they're not caring. We don't want them to be that way. They will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. So hopefully I can be an example to my children. They can imitate me as I imitate Christ. And that's what our testimony is all about. See? Sharing the glorious works that Jesus has done for us. Sharing his miracles. And so you all have a marriage, you all have a testimony, every single one of you. God has, has, has saved your life. So I encourage you, tell your family, tell your friends, tell everyone what the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been to you. So with that, I'll, I'm going to end it early so that way we can all just go around the table and share the good news of what Jesus has done in your lives. I think it's important for us to practice that and, and share that with our children, our grandchildren one day. And, and praise the Lord, give him glory. Amen. No, amen.